<laughs> Martin Eastburn says, Howdy from East Texas. I have that picture of the horse head. It scared a friend, so I removed it from my background on my screens. <laughs> it scared him? How did it scare him? It's I don't beautiful. know. You know, I guess that there's a Halloween ish kind of uh, nebula, and there's a few out there. This yeah, would like, definitely be one yeah. of them. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have been Casper. Spooky. A little spooky. That's because of the, the, the timer. One of the things I noticed since uh, Facebook has now come back, come back up is that the lag time from the time I broadcast to the time it actually broadcasts on Facebook is a lot shorter. Yeah, well, that's good. So it's improved. Yeah, so they did something something good. What about Twitch and YouTube and all the other channels? Well, Twitch uh, today, um, you know, they're, they're requiring me to re-log on and reset my stream keys and all the rest of it, so I'll have to do that later. Um, so we're temporarily not on Twitch. Uh, Twitter, also similar kind of thing. They, they used to have a Twitter Periscope, which is no more. So I have to figure that part out. Huh. But we are, on, we are on Cloudy Nights. We are on YouTube and we're on Facebook right now. So oh, goody, we're on Cloudy Nights. <laughs> yeah. And ExploreScientific.com. So. Yeah, correct. Uh, Harold Locke, hello, Rascals, R-A-S-C. ALS. <laughs> Rascal. Who he's yep. calling Rascal? Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, ALS. Nice.
It was the spring of 1609 in Venice when Galileo learned about a new device invented by a Dutch eyeglass maker through which faraway objects could be viewed as if they were nearby. Spectacles compared to telescopes are very low tech, but they had been around for several hundred years. Okay. It was only when lenses became available in certain range of strength mm. that one could take the, the weakest convex lens and combine it with the strongest concave lens and get an appreciable magnifying effect. Galileo worked out the mathematics of the telescope and was certain he could make it more useful. Hearing reports of a new invention from a lens maker in Holland, I determined to fashion a device for myself and was able to make a considerable improvement in it. Galileo realized that spectacle makers could not give him the lenses that he needed in order to make this device more powerful. They just weren't good enough and they weren't uh, the right strength. And so in order to improve the instrument, he had to teach himself to find lenses. And that is extremely difficult. It certainly was in 1610. Initially, Galileo was most interested in improving the optics of the telescope. And by grinding his own lenses, he was able to increase the power of his telescope tenfold. But soon, Galileo began using his telescope to explore the heavens, observing the rough surface of the moon, phases of Venus, moons of Jupiter, and sunspots. Each new improvement in the technology of the telescope brought greater and greater understanding of the universe. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And today I'm with Tyler Bowman. Uh, Tyler, uh, Tyler's been on with us uh, <laughs> several different times um, and uh, more than several different times on our live programming. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't know if you guys know that he's a avid amateur astrophotographer. And uh, so, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> Anyways, um, so Tyler is going to go through, uh, you know, how beginners or, you know, non-beginners can choose the right telescope mount camera combination. So that's something we often, a question we get in customer service a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Tyler. Oh boy. Let it rip. Let it rip, he says. So if anybody that doesn't know me, which most of everybody does, but I've never really been on the focus on astrophotography show yet. So I'm hoping to make more of an appearance, um, kind of talk more about astrophotography, getting either beginners or intermediates. We'll talk about all sorts of stuff from A to Z, uh, from mounts, telescopes, cameras. So it's going to be a long journey. I hope you're willing to sit back and enjoy some popcorn because it's going to be a charade. Let me tell you, yeah, it's going to be a fun, right. fun charade. Uh, but like Scott said, I want to mainly talk about what customers always call in about is what mountain should I get? What telescope should I get? Um, again, we'll talk about cameras later because there's a lot more involved with cameras. Uh, but today we're just going to talk about just three basic telescopes that, that some people ask about, especially getting into astrophotography, is refractors anywhere from an 80 millimeter to our 102 all the way up to our 8 inch 208 um, from Bresser. Um, it all really, the foundation is the most important part. And where the foundation lies is the mount. Now with a mount, you need to know weight capacity. You need to know um, mainly just the weight capacity. How I always gauge the weight capacity is I look at the specs that's on a website or in the manual. I usually, Scott may have to correct me on this, I always divide it by half on some mounts. But our mounts, they're rated, the Laws Manny G11 is rated on paper for 60 pounds. I honestly right. think it can go a lot higher than that, but that's what the paper says is 60 pounds. Now our Exos 2 PMC8, it's rated for a payload of 28 pounds for astrophotography and for 40 for visual, but we're just mainly, again, we're talking about astrophotography. But with the IXOS 100, it's rated for nine for astrophotography. Now you always have to remember those numbers because it will kind of determine and dictate what telescope that you're gonna get along with telescope or your cameras, guide scopes, guide cameras, whatever, cables, because cables add weight to everything. Uh, I started out 
with a DSLR and a telephoto lens. And it's, it was a great little entry point. Uh, we used a, just a basic tripod, uh, had a wide kit lens. It was a, I believe it was a Nikon D3200. So it was a $300 uh, DSLR, but it opened the floodgate. <laughs> It really did, and then I found out that Explore Scientific was here, and then Scott sunk his teeth in me and never let me go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it here. There is an alternate version of that story. Okay, <laughs> so. no, Scott's been. Great. No, we're glad Tyler's here. Of course, uh, I love it here. The the camaraderie and the employees here are fantastic to be around. Um, Scott's he's pretty cool. He's a good okay guy. Um, He's, he's all right. Yeah. He's, an okay he's an okay guy. But back, back to the topic again. I started with a DSLR. It was great for beginners. So if you're a little tight with money, start with a DSLR. I mean, that's, that's what we're filming with here is a DSLR. Um, as you can see, the panning is this DSLR. I mean, that's it. Uh, but if you want to upgrade, always start with the foundation first. And I'm, I'm seeing a shoulder. <laughs> it's because the cameraman's messing with stuff. It's throwing me off a little bit. But that's fine. Uh, <laughs> the foundation again is the starting point. So we want to start with a mount. So again, whether it's an IXOS 100, an XOS 2 PMC8, a Lazmany G11 with PMC8, we want to make sure we have a great foundation. Once we get that foundation, we can build up from there. I always, for beginners that are stepping up into the telescope world, is always a 80 millimeter refractor mm -hmm. here. Let me bring it up so everybody can actually see it. There we go. Now, this little baby is literally the most compact thing ever. I mean, it's, that's as big as it gets. It's lightweight. Uh, I think it's less than 10 pounds, right, Scott? On yeah, the, that's right. I think, it's, I think it's less than 10. I don't have the, the books in front of me. But this is what Scott got me into starting out. Uh, he recommended just a wide field just to get started. Because, I mean, I wasn't familiar yet with polar alignment to the degree I am now. So it's always great to start with the wide fields. You can have a little bit of play with guiding, so you don't have to be so crucial with the balance, the polar alignment, or any of that stuff. But again, we're gonna talk about those as well. They are, they provide a very crucial role with astrophotography, but with such a wide angle lens, it being 480 millimeters of focal length, it's not as needed or as stressed as compared to a 208, because you got an eight inch mirror back here she's heavy so she's 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 a big girl she's got to be treated the right way uh and the <coughs> excuse me over here where the camera's pointing at now that is the it's a equi german equatorial mount i believe it is the flar 102 1000 mm -hmm. yes it is yes and it comes with a two inch focuser it's great for visual and astrophotography so being a doublet it's awesome for solar it is amazing for solar and we're going to pan to one more on the opposite end back there there's a microscope in the way so we do apologize okay. um, that's a mac cas mac cas it that's a 110 so that's 1400 or that's a 100 and that's 1400 millimeters of focal length that's perfect for planetary so i always like to consider the, the mount that it's on it's a good question paul is it's on an Exos 2 GT. That's the go-to mount. Um, that's a great entry-level mount. It's it's a it's a good basic entry-level mount. It'll definitely get you going to what you're needing to do to get you started, get you more familiar with balance, polar align, how to do with proper guiding, and all that stuff. But what we also want to try to do is make sure that we got a good foundation. We got a good starting point, whether it's an 80 millimeter. The 102, which is at 714, I'll pick that up and move it over just a little. It's going to block my head a little bit, but that's okay. So, but again, we always get the customers that ask, but I want to do uh, Messier objects. I want to do some planetary, and I also want to do some visual. And A, it all depends on the mount. It really does. I mean, 90% of this stuff is mount goal oriented. Because you know, without a good foundation, you're going to have a poor experience. You really are. I'm not kidding, folks. 
I fought it for years until I got with Scott, and then Scott showed me the actual correct way to do things. Um, I did a lot of research, but it's great to have someone local here to pick the brain, and he's a great mind to pick. Uh, but with a 714 millimeters of focal length on the 102, it's, it's a great in-betweener for a step up from an 80, especially if you're getting a bigger mount. <clears throat> with the 714, you can definitely do some planetary. You can do a lot of terrestrial viewing, solar, uh, deep, mainly deep sky objects would be my best preference. Um, on this, and it's it's a great start, another great starting refractor. Um, the also great thing about beginners and refractors is you don't have to mess much with collimation um, at all, and that's the beauty. You can almost you can drop these, and they'll they'll hold collimation. I don't know if Scott wants to attest to that because he's been around longer than I have in this industry. Scott, how many times have you dropped a refractor and it's held the collimation? Uh, you know, I've dropped a lot of different telescopes. <laughs> And uh, refractors, if any of them is going to hold collimation, uh, uh, you know, more consistently, it is going to be a refractor. You know, the, yeah. um, you know, the, of course, we, we always put, you know, uh, in most of our telescopes, we have a, uh, you know, mechanical uh, uh, front cell that you can indeed collimate, okay? Yes. Uh, there are refractors that are sold out there. In fact, out of the Vixen line, there's uh, there is uh, a couple of designs that uh, where everything is uh, designed just to be perfect. Okay, where uh, you don't collimate it, but that is um, that's a, a, a little bit tough. Uh, you know, uh, Pentax refractors. If you ever saw a Pentax refractor, uh, no collimation adjustments at all. Nor is it required. Wow. Um, but um, I like a telescope you can tweak just a little bit better, you know. Yeah, so I would agree um, with that. You know, so that's that is something that yeah. uh, that I, I like to have. Um, and I think that you're right. You know, starting off with wider uh, focal length does make things a lot easier as mm -hmm. your skills improve with the mount. So, um, and the more often you do this, of course, the better and better you get. And of so I, you know, I, I can attest by looking at uh tyler's images that he is uh you know he he definitely uh, improved his uh his images his focusing his guiding all of that stuff uh by leaps and bounds you know so it was it, really impressive you're shooting with a 127 now is that right uh the 127 yes sir right yep. yeah so that's good that's kind of when you're up to that kind here. of focal length what's that I don't, I don't have the 127 on here, but it's, that was going to be the next one is uh, sure. we have a lot of people call in on, again, what telescope to get. You know, if they have a, a good foundation of a mount that can hold a lot of weight, the next after the 80 is a 127. I right. always recommend the 127 because it is, in my opinion, my opinion only, Scott may deny this opinion, um, <laughs> it is the best scope we have. In my, for astrophotography. It is certainly it has, the most popular selling scope we have. It is. That's for sure. It's, it's got, I think, the, the overall best focal length for planetary, mm -hmm. nebulae, Messier objects, all of them. It's got the perfect range of focal length. And if mm -hmm. I throw a reducer on it, it makes it even better. It mm -hmm. honestly does. I mean, I don't know what you guys were thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, when you were designing that scope, but I'm glad you stuck with right around the nine, so was it 952? Yeah, 952 right. millimeters of focal length. Because it's, it's honestly perfect for astrophotography. So if you, if you want to spend a little extra money compared to the 80 or the 102 that's sitting over here, I would honestly get the 127. I really would. Right. I really, really would. They're, uh, they're but if you're amazing. a beginner, if you're a beginner, I, you're a I beginner, still recommend something that is shorter focal length. An 80 millimeter or a 102 can be used in combination with a bigger, longer focal length telescope as a guide scope or as a yep. secondary uh, imaging telescope to get wider field, you know? I so. mean, you can look at Scott's mount back there, folks, is he's got the 102 on the bottom and his uh, 80 millimeter sitting up top. So, right. I mean, he's... And that's on a G11. So, I that, pick yes. the mount first. Correct. Get the foundation And then I pick correctly. the telescopes to fit what kind of astrophotography I want to do with it. So, so I mean, he's he can pick out the, the, the reason, I think, why he goes with an ED-80 for a guide scope. 
Um, most people would think that's overkill, but I don't believe it is because with ED, extra low dispersion, he's able to see the low magnitude stars and he's able to guide, pinpoint. Like if his polar alignment's dead on, that mount will just sit there and guide like a dream and he can go to sleep and won't have to worry about anything, nothing. Uh, and that's, I, re I believe that's the reason why he went that route and the 102 being at 714, it is such a nice refractor and wide field. You can get a majority of the, the double clusters that are in our solar system mm -hmm. that, that are out there with, with that combination. Um, but I know he, he's got certain cameras that he uses. Again, we will definitely talk about those, about pixel scale, which right. cameras go best with which telescope. Um, but that's definitely going to be later shows um, because that may be longer than our shows. I hate to say it. Right. There's well, a lot of information. You can always do, we can always do a longer program. That's not a problem. Ken what Noble wants to know, when is he going to see my images? Okay. I built that astrograph, uh, my, my image, my, my time <laughs> doing uh, what I would call like... Um, uh, Periodic imaging. Yeah, no, there was a period of time where I was really quite serious into it. Um, and that was from the time that we were still shooting film, okay, yep. to when digital imaging first started, you know, and a, a, a camera company called uh, Santa Barbara Instruments Group made a debut of their ST4 camera, and then later had the ST6. And I was doing that kind of early uh, digital imaging and learning about it. Um, uh, with this telescope, this rig that I have set up here, it's actually an outreach rig. And for other people to uh, log into it via Zoom, and uh, you know, as part of our mentor training program that we mm -hmm. have, so. And that's, that's another great point. Scott, and then we'll talk about this 208 here, is, is to find sure. a good mentor, if it's possible, local, either in an astronomy group that's local to where you live, is if you have the camaraderie and someone to help you and guide you along, so you don't make unnecessary expenditures, like I have, before I found <laughs> Explore Scientific. <laughs> Hope my wife's not watching this. <laughs> but that that is honestly where the wealth of knowledge is because there's always at least a handful of astrophotographers in a astronomical group that is in a local area um I, our sugar creek one um, i'm part of one there's at least 10 in our group and i always if i have an issue i always pick their brain and then there's facebook you you can definitely ask a bunch of questions on facebook there's tons of groups you can even ask the explore scientific user group we will definitely guide you to the correct whichever way or path that you would like to go. We really will, because uh, that's what we do here at Explore Scientific is we make sure we take care of the customer because you're the best. You're the, what we want to help the most. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, we try that's hard, let's just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, the, the 208 is, it's, it's, it is definitely a unique brand of Newtonian compared to refractors, because again, I'm gonna move these off to the side here. With refractors, you you literally with an eighty, you just set it up and go. By, by the way, the eighty, the eighty without you know just strip down the way that it is, is about six pounds. Well, perfect. That that fits on the IXOS one hundred perfectly. Right. Um, you throw a DSLR on there, you're you're right within the the nine pound max limit. I mean, you can push it a little bit. We have customers that push. Oh my the goodness. IXOS. Let's say again, right. Scott. I said, my goodness, you know, we, we've, we've seen photographs of the IXOS yes. 100 really yeah, loaded up, we've, you know, we've 15 pounds with, on it. Uh, oh. What, six inch SCTs on those? On right. the IXOS 100s. So, I mean, they, right. they can handle it. Um, it's just a recommendation. Use it at your own risk. As long as your balance is good and your polar alignment is great, you'll have exponential results. You really will. Um, 208, I'm not going to move it too far because it will cut me halfway off and everybody likes to see the whole me, not just half of me. Um, but with the Newtonian, the, you have, oh, there, I was able to do it. Perfect. The, you have obviously the primary mirror that sits in the back. I'm trying to get it in the camera, but you see that wonderful little black dot in the middle? That's your secondary. So how it works is light comes in, hits the secondary or the primary mirror in the back, hits the secondary mirror back in the front and comes out here in the, uh, eyepiece. So most people, <clears throat> when they use Newtonians, they'll literally point the 
object, I'm not, the eyepiece side all the way down to the ground. So your camera is just sitting there dangling right underneath everything. Uh, what people like about Newtonians is, what I think, is it's got some, it's definitely got reach. It's 852 millimeters of focal length. It's the, the artifacts that everybody gets on the bright stars. Because with the veins that are in here, I know you can't see them, but there are veins that hold the secondary mirror in, and you get the refraction or diffraction spikes on stars, and everybody seems to like them. It does produce a nice image, uh, but she is very heavy in the back. She has an eight-inch mirror. I don't. You'll have to ask Scott because again, I don't have a computer in front of me. How heavy the Bresser N two hundred eight is? N two hundred eight. Because sure. if you're wanting to start out with a Newtonian. And the other thing you also have to remember is you have to collimate. That is, that's, I try not to tell beginners to do it because of collimation, especially if they're just starting. But if they have messed with collimation or have dabbled with collimation, then I will recommend a breast or two or a N20839. Um, you have a line, you put a collimation tool here, which shoots a laser into the secondary, bounces back to the primary, which you align the secondary to the primary. And then you adjust the primary back here with some knobs. I'll turn it around real quick without trying to drop the telescope and costing millions of dollars and everything. There's those knobs. Now with those knobs that adjust just the primary mirror in the back, and then you have three knobs, which is going to be hard for to see. There they are. There's three knobs right there in the front, and three little thumb knobs or thumb screw knobs that align the secondary to the primary. It can get kind of confusing as a beginner. It definitely can. I didn't, I didn't start out with a Newtonian. I'm a refractor guy. I love refractors. They're just, they're easier to use. They don't have to acclimate to the temperatures outside compared to a big one, especially with a bigger mirror. Um, so always remember that. The bigger the telescope, if it's a Newt or if it's a Schmidt Cassegrain, you have to allow time for them to completely acclimate, acclimate or focus can be off. You'd be amazed what temperature can do to focus. It will distort a star and ruin an image, and you'll be very upset <laughs> when you wake up the next morning. And you're like, why are my images fuzzy? I don't like this. <laughs> I don't, don't like, like that. This. Uh, um, uh, Tyler, let's, uh, we got questions, comments, good. stuff like that from the group here. Um, uh, people are uh, saying hello, welcome back. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. let's see. You're going to be seeing my smiling face more and more. That's right. Um, Drum roll. Let's see. I'm lots of <laughs> hellos and highs. There must and, be a lot of people. Why don't we, uh, after the questions, why don't we recognize uh, some of the people that are on? Yeah. Okay. Well, we can do that right now. So okay. the first one to log on today was Harold Locke. Um, he Good. says, thank God it's Friday. Uh, it's focused on astrophotography. Hello, stargazers. Uh, Martin Eastburn, uh, howdy from East Texas. Um, he was the one that was had to take down his image of the horse head because it was scaring his friends. Uh, Martin, I think you just need to put it back up or put it somewhere else. <laughs> um, Don't be ashamed of your work because your friends have no taste. Right. Uh, we have Beatrice Hines. We've got Pekka Hautala on. Um, uh, we have uh, Rascal's Hobbies, okay? Who's Obviously, a, a handle one. here. Um, That's a new one. He says, howdy from North Dakota, you know. Huh. Um, that? That's right. Everybody likes to use the, the term howdy. That's I think that is the official greeting it was official Southern of the Explorer Alliance. <laughs> howdy. How are you howdy. doing? Howdy. That's right. Um, let's see. Uh, we have um, Jim's Astro is watching. Um, yep. I, I think I know Jim. Yeah. Yep. I mentioned Martin Eastburn, um, yep. Beatrice Hines. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. <clears throat> Richard Grace is watching, of course. Usually Richard's like the first guy He's to log on. He's always the first one. Usually. Not Usually today. Not today. You know, so. Um, Rascal's Hobby says, I only have an 80 millimeter Orion that I bought years ago. That's a great mm -hmm. scope to get started yeah, with. They you are. Know? So if you're not doing astrophotography yet um you know master that one and then mm -hmm. you know if you need to move on move on you know so um uh, but he says his dream is to go 
get a go-to mount and a big scope from Explore Scientific, you know? I mean, we have them. Start with the mount first. Start, yep. You know, if you want to, if you know you're going to go big later, get a big mount to start off with. Spend your money there, okay? Yes, and, speaking uh, of mounts, um, I've decided to take the plunge because I'm following Jerry and following... You'll notice that when you join an astrophotography group, your friends will always push you to get more and more stuff, spend more and more money because you want to. Uh, you always want to one up your friends. It's just it's, it's competition. <laughs> but every every one of my friends have got a peer, and now this weekend, uh -huh. I'm going to be building a peer. Oh, nice! I won't be physically doing it because I can't lift anything. I've messed my back up. Always lift with your your legs, never your back. Yes. Um, so I'm going to help by motivation and giving my plenty motivation. of water uh, to, we're going to okay. dig a hole. We're going to use an auger, dig a hole, Good. put a pier on, and I'm going to be, I want to be set. I will literally be able to remote into my system from work, like from wherever. Permanently set up, permanently It'll be permanently aligned. set. Uh, I think I will kind of want to do what you're doing, Scott, as far as some outreach. I mm -hmm. want to get more outreach under my belt um, yeah. and just give password username and just you know you want to use it use it for the night you can yeah, you become kind of the out. night assistant you know in that regard you know with yeah. the telescope it is and it's right. literally just push a button you're ready to go you're done and right. i blame a lot of my friends for pushing me to, to this direction <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's good like i said it's good competition uh they're wanting me to be better and that's what i like and that's what good friends do is they they want you to succeed and get better but uh, right. Scott, you said there were some comments and yeah, um, uh, it's still more people that are that are watching here. Andrew Corkill, he says uh, he's saying hello to Beatrice Hines. Um, <laughs> good topic today. I never want to drop my 152 ED refractor. Scott will have to help me recall them. <laughs> uh, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about Scott. Yeah, no problem. Drop it. It's okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Norm Hughes is watching. Yep. Um, uh, Jim's Astro wanted to know if we have any ED 127s in stock. Actually, uh, we, we, we have some coming through. I don't know if they're all sold already, but uh, uh, we, uh, Jim, we have 127 carbon fibers in. In right stock. Now, okay. Yeah. We, they're in stock. Look on our we're website. QC. It should be updated. Yep. So correct. We're okay. QCing them right now, making sure they're all prim and proper before they go to new homes. Is what we're doing. Yeah. Here's a question for you: How is the ED 127 for lunar photography? Lunar photography, I mean, you're being at 952, you're still going to probably have to introduce a Barlow or a focal extender into the image train. Uh, but also, again, it depends on what camera you use. Hmm. Something with a small sensor, I mean, you can use a two times Barlow. I've seen people use a three times. Five times is overkill, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Uh, three, two times to three times, again, depending on a camera, which we'll talk about cameras later is then we'll talk about pixel scale. I mean, it's all about the pixels. The smaller that sensor, the more pump, the more, oh, I'm getting close to it. Um, but it, it all depends on, but yeah, yeah. To answer your question, the 127 would be a good one for Lunar. We have really some nice be. images from the 127, yes, so. I mean, we, uh, we got an astrophotography <clears throat> contest about Lunar, don't we? It's solar and uh, terrestrial, yeah, it's right? Yeah, it's a solar system object, for sure. Yeah. So. so, I mean, um, Astro Bin's always a good start. And that's another good thing is, is oh, yeah. Astro Bin is always a good reference point uh, to find out. You can always just go to their big wall search, type in Explore Scientific 127, and it will literally just flood your home screen with just images of that scope. Uh, same thing with astronomy.tools. Astronomy.tools literally got me up and running. Because it when I started into astrophotography, I didn't know what camera to get with my particular scope. And with that beautiful website, you are able to pick a telescope, explore scientific, down to Williams Optic. It, it's got them all. And you can put a camera with it, which from again from A Tech all the way to ZWO or ATIC. I'm not familiar with ATICs. And you can pick a specific camera, and you can pick a Messier object, lunar, uh, sometimes NGCs, depends on if it's in its database, 
and it will give you a field of view. It will literally frame it up on the screen and it will give you an idea on what kind of image scale you'll have and it's how, how it'll look with framing because that's, that's really what we do in astro astrophotography. We've got to make sure that frame is perfect you know, for that poster board that Scott prints out for everybody when you win astrophotography contests. You, know, you got to make sure that framing's just right. Um, but those are I'm, definitely... I'm going to show them uh, Astro Ben. Yeah. I just it. typed in Explore Scientific and Moon, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, check this out. There's a ton. I'm not, I'm not kidding. There's a ton. I mean, Look it's just like, it's a beautiful collage of lunar yeah. photography here and many, many pages um, that you can see. And so uh, if you want to know specifically, at a, like an Explore Scientific 127, you would just add that into the search term, but um, let's see what this one is right here. Nice I image. Like that. That's nice. This is I mean, through that's... an Explore Scientific 16 inch Dobsonian. Okay, which meant no wow. tracking. Okay. No tracking, that's, that's, that's Isn't that beautiful. That's amazing. Right? So see, so you can people, see all the even, mineral. Even, even with a push go to, a push system you can achieve even great stills like that. Um, so, it, I mean, it doesn't really acquire a lot of knowledge. It's just a, really just a gumption of wanting to try something differently. Um, yes, there, is, there are learning curves with everything new that you want to try. There, it's, it's inevitable. Um, but the knowledge, the knowledge base is out there, and you can call yep. us if, I mean, I don't like to read. I really don't. I don't like to read. I'm not a big avid reader, but sometimes you do have to read to understand how things work with the astrophotography aspect. I mean, look at that that moon just. Yeah. I, I mean, now that's through a 102. Okay. That's crazy. Yeah. Beautiful. But reading upon reading upon reading, and we're also going to talk about pre-processing what images or what software to use depending on what you're trying to shoot. There's SharpCap. There's APT. There's Nina. There's SGP. Trust me, folks, it's going to be a long journey, let me tell you. That's an interesting shot. That is pretty neat. Yeah. So what is that? That is, um, doesn't say exactly which scope. I was <laughs> missing it. Imaging well, folks, telescope. Explore scientific. Oh, this is through one of our eyepieces. Oh, nice. So he's not saying which model telescope it is. It just says which eyepiece. This is eyepiece projection. Oh, even better. Yeah. More with that framing, it looks like the 102. Yeah, it could be. It looks like, could be. Could be. But uh, that's what I got for today, Scott. Unless, oh, that's pretty. <laughs> he right. keeps he keeps flashing pretty pictures over here off to my side, and it, it just stops me cold dead in my tracks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, I'll stop sharing. But um, you, you okay. got any more questions? Well, uh, people want to know when you're going to show some of your personal astrophotography. Well, okay, go to ask, go back to Astro Ben for me. Okay. I only have two images on there. I do a lot of testing. Scott can attest to this. I'm I'm taking home telescope. He's a tester. I am a I am a avid tester. I, that's all I do. I don't really publish, but uh, if once Scott gets Astro Ben back up, and I'll have him look for my page. Uh, my username Scott's astronomy underscore Tyler. Astronomy underscore Tyler, okay. Um, there sh there'll be two pictures there. One's a solar and one is, which Pekka, if he's still on, he'll like the solar, which I believe you've seen it in any way. Um, but then there's a, I'm working on a wide field shot. Um, astronomy or astrophotography? Astronomy. Pretty sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it is astronomy, yes, sir. Um, I'm working on a wide field shot. I've just done the HA data so far, uh, the Heart and the Soul Nebula which once he gets it pulled up, if he's able to find me, he may not be able to find me. <laughs> there's, there's no telling. Um, Here we go. Astronomy. <laughs> but guys, don't. Underscore Tyler, Tyler, right? Yeah. It should have my beautiful face with an ED80 kind of goofy. There's no smile. results, sorry. Maybe I got deleted. Hang on, I'll... Uh, I can't use my phone. I'm pretty sure it was a strong. I'll tell you Instagram. what we'll, we'll do. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have Tyler. Yep. Um, 
<laughs> we'll have him uh, get a collection of his images yeah. together. That's to what we'll do. You. That'll make it right? a lot easier. That's better. Humbling. Yeah, it's a lot better. Right? More, more, more organized. Um, but folks, I hope, I really hope you enjoyed the just the foundation level. Granted, we will, we will always touch base on the foundation level because this is the most important part of the structure. Without a good foundation, you're going to topple. There's just there's no other way around it. You're going to struggle. Guiding is going to be off. Uh, it's the guy, I mean, mainly it's just going to be guiding is going to be off. Your images are going to be horrible. I mean, there's just no way around it. Um, but next week, we got Gary Palmer on the show. Um, in my opinion, Gary Palmer is a world-renowned, I call him a world-renowned solar imager. Uh, he takes great Tons, images. He, no doubt. He's, he's, he's I, he, I classify him as a tester as well. He's like me. He tests a lot of equipment to the show and to tell customers that these are, these are great. This is what you can start with as a beginner, intermediate, uh, or, or I, I mean, there's really no experts in the field, but an expert. Um, I mean, I, the scientists, in my opinion, are experts um, because they're getting paid for it. <laughs> I guess I am too, in a, to a degree. Um, yeah, you'd be surprised how many research astronomers, though, don't, they don't put their hands on telescopes. They don't, if you ask them, you know, okay, well, you see, you know, uh, Eculus and Delphinius and, and these kind, they're like, huh? don't really know those, Scott, you know, so. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that. Now, that's not true of all professional astronomers. Some of them are yeah. extremely knowledgeable about the sky and extremely knowledgeable about gear, okay? But, um you know, I think that your your average researcher is more interested in the physics and the numbers and the data than they are anything else. But we're, we're going to have Gary Palmer on the show next week. We're going to talk about some pre-processing software and a little bit of post. I, I kind of want to talk about post more in depth and have longer than maybe 25 minutes on pre or post. Uh, but we're going to talk mainly about pre-processing. Um, when he does solar imaging or deep sky imaging. And I hope you guys stick around and stay tuned for the next one. Because again, we're back every Friday, four o'clock Central Standard Time here at Explore Scientific. I'm Tyler, hope to see you guys again. Everybody knows Scott Roberts because he's the man of Explore Scientific. I'm just a person here. <laughs> You're just a person. I give everybody uh, the knowledge. I don't know. <laughs> so. Yeah. Anyways, it's great, Tyler. Thank you very much uh, for coming on today. And um, I will uh, add that, uh, you know, we, we are definitely going to dive into uh, the nuts and bolts of how to get uh, great astrophotographs, you know, stuff that you'll be proud of. Uh, and, you know, we can, who knows where it will go. I mean, I would love to um, uh, have a program where we uh, you know, catalog or document something, follow somebody that is going on their path, their journey, you know, as we go along. So, well, believe it or not, there, the, there's a local group or a local couple, uh, husband mm -hmm. and wife, uh, they came in earlier today. You're, you're familiar with them, Donna and Donna oh, yeah. Houston. Right. Mm -hmm. They came in today. They were having so much trouble with, they have a, um, a sit, a, a, a Celestron 11 inch edge HD that they just could not get in focus. And then oh. who do they come to? They come to me. I got it to focus, but I definitely struggled for a minute because trying to get the proper back focus with such a long 20, 2800 millimeters of focal length. Oh, yeah. Is a booger. It really yeah. is because you've got to nail that back focus down. And that's where reading the specifications on particular telescopes to make sure this is what you really want to do. Because if you try to do that during the nighttime with that much focal length, you're going to kick stuff. <laughs> you really are. On it's purpose. Cool. <laughs> you will kick stuff. He was using a, uh, a, a, an a, a ZWO224, uh, which is a, a very small planetary pixeled camera. Oh, it's yeah. A, with all it's that about focal length, length. It's, it's, that's very tough. It's, it's very tiny. Tough. But I was able to zoom in on some pine cones out here in the parking lot. I, he was happier to kid in a candy store uh, but, but i want them to come on the show actually and they've been sure. doing it for about seven months and they just built a pier in their backyard oh wonderful really um and i want them to come on here and, and and just show us and tell us the journey of what they've had to struggle endured and their success uh, for doing this for seven months so guys i'm not kidding you i'm going to put a lot of effort and thought into this and try to get you guys the experience that you deserve 
for astrophotography. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, Scott can kick me. <laughs> Not happening. Okay. <laughs> ah. I just want to make sure that everybody's given the correct information and the right information to help them succeed. That's what I really want out of this. Great. Um, and I know Scott agrees with that. Yeah. So okay. I'm, that's it. I'm done. All right. So, uh, so tonight um, we are going to broadcast part of the Heart of America Star Party. I'm going to get, be giving a lecture uh, um, uh, that, uh, you know, where I'll take people through Explore Scientific and show them uh, the different um, aspects of our company, uh, our brands, um, but kind of it's sort of a walk through the building, really. Um, and then uh, I think uh, Jackie Beischer will be uh, coming on with us live from the Heart of America Star Party to talk about the event, why you should go, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, it's going to be great. And that's going to start at 7 o'clock, which is um, uh, it's 444 here right now. So, uh, mm. you know, a couple hours from now, uh, you'll see us uh pop back up with a live program. So thanks very much. And uh, we will see you. Uh, oh, and also on Saturday, sorry, <laughs> is the kickoff party for the International Observe the Moon Night. OK, uh, so that will that will be happening um, as well. And so that I just got to uh, uh, do some short interviews with a lot of the people that were on there. Some people like um, the uh, visualization people from NASA are going to be on, and the visualization people from uh, Goddard Space Flight Center will be on. And so uh, Vivian White has uh, included an incredible lineup of speakers, uh, so you're not going to want to miss that. Um, and that will be tomorrow. Uh, it's on our calendar, and so I'll, I'll I'll make sure it's all updated. We had to switch calendars, by the way. Uh, once we had landed on an app that was doing a beautiful calendar, they decided to stop. <laughs> I guess they went out of business. I don't know what happened. Okay, but that that uh, calendar's gone. Okay. We have a new calendar uh, that we're implementing right now. So until that time, you guys, Alrighty. keep looking up. We'll talk to you later. See y'all. Bye-bye. Vivian White here from the NASA Night Sky Network and I just want to invite you all to join us for the Global Moon Party happening October 9th uh, from 3 p.m. on uh, that specific time 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We are going to have such a blast. We have great folks from the International Observe the Moon Night joining us. We have NASA friends from the Visualization Studio and moon treks and uh, all over the place. We have Icelandic poets to talk about the moon, presenting new work that they're doing. Um, space agencies from around the world will join us and we hope you will too. Please uh, get the word out. Let everyone you know who loves the moon know that we are kicking off the International Observe the Moon Night this October 9th. See you there. Hi everyone, this is Terry Mann and I'm the Secretary of the Astronomical League and the co-host of Astronomical League Live. We have a special event coming up on October 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're going to have a kind of Halloween party online. We have quite a few speakers. The first one is one of our regulars, one of our favorites, David Levy and he will be doing celestial incantations. 
Next up, we'll have Mary Stewart Adams, Passing Between the Worlds Under October Skies. We've also got Astro Bob, Black Holes Where Matter Goes to Die. And Molly Wakeling, Spooky Nebula of the Night. And John Goss, the Master of Lunacy. And we do expect that name to stick. Barbara Harris, Algol, the Demon Star. Myself, Aurora, Soul of the Night. And we've got Carol Orge, the president of the Astronomical League. We're going to put a wizard hat on him and let him work his magic. So please let me personally invite you to join us October 15th, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, right here. We hope to see you. Why do we chase this thing? Jumping from one continent to the next, just to bathe for a moment in the absence of light? Who are we? What are we searching for? T.S. Eliot wrote, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. One of the qualities of seeing an eclipse is it makes you understand that every given thing is in a particular patterned relation with every other thing. It gives me a sense of scale. It gives me a sense of where I fit into the universe. It is, is art, it's poetry, it's this kind of experience of going and, and seeing totality in which what feels merely metaphorical is suddenly an experiential encounter. Immediately afterwards, you have that overwhelming desire to see another one. That's the moment an eclipse chaser is born. These are folks who are running all over the world for this event that lasts all of two or three minutes. Who are these people? It's unique each time. And therefore, that freshness, even if we've seen it over and over again, oh my gosh, it has the potential to re-inspire us. The total eclipse of the sun doesn't just unfold in the heavens. It transforms the minds and hearts of those who experience it firsthand. The same is true of journeys to the most remote regions of our planet. Whether we're standing on a mountain peak or in a stark polar landscape, we can't help but reflect on our place within the larger scheme of things. Thank <laughs> you. 